Statistically speaking, only a very small number of the people in this room are likely to ever write a book. Whether it's fiction, nonfiction, a graphic novel, or a book of poetry, it's hard to write a book. Take it from me, I still have my unfinished great American novel sitting on my laptop. <laughs> and when I say unfinished, I mean I've been on page 267 for the last three years. So can we all agree that writing a book is often a monumental effort? And actually getting a book published and onto bookstore shelves is often an even greater mountain to climb? On the flip side, did you know that every person in this room, every person in this country actually, has the ability to call for the banning of a book, or 10 books, or even 100 books at a time? It's always easier to destroy than to create, but book banning can have devastating consequences to the readers who need those books most. I'm leveraging my interests in book collecting, exploration, and technology to preserve banned or threatened books in secure data vaults located deep in the Arctic permafrost on storage media designed to last 2,000 years or longer, or eternity, whichever comes later. I founded the Eternal Access Project to permanently, irrefutably, preserve the books, ideas, and contents of, of works that have either been threatened with censorship in years past or are currently being threatened today. These books will be available for future generations should all other copies of a book become unavailable or cease to exist. I also want to make a clear statement to the book banners that long after they are dust, the books and ideas that they are trying to silence will live on a thousand times longer than they might naturally have if the book banners did not seek to have dominion over them. <laughs> because book banners are fighting battles today against words and ideas, I want to do my part to ensure that they lose the war. Book banners have tried to censor books ranging from The Wind in the Willows to Alice in Wonderland, The Giver, Gulliver's Travels, Tom Sawyer, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Great Gatsby, Toni Morrison's Beloved, Catcher in the Rye. They've even tried to ban the books 1984 and Fahrenheit 451. Do you realize how hypocritical it is for the Thought Police to ban a book about the Thought Police? <laughs> and burn a book about book burning? <laughs> the idea for the Eternal Access Project led me north of the Arctic Circle to Svalbard, Norway, which is located halfway between Northern Europe and the North Pole. I first learned about Svalbard when I was researching the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is oftentimes referred to as the Doomsday Vault, containing millions of seeds for every important crop variety in the world today. I learned that there was also a secure data vault on Svalbard, and that got the gears in my head spinning. I thought, somebody ought to be storing banned books up there for safekeeping. And then I remembered, if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> the Eternal Access Project collection is located in Longyearbyen, which is the northernmost city in the world located on Svalbard. The remote location combined with its many polar bears provides natural protection against, <laughs> against potential threat actors. And in short, it is not easy to get to. Permafrost ice covers the entire landmass of Svalbard and Longyearbyen has only about 2,400 residents. Don't get me wrong, it actually is a lovely place and even boasts the world's northernmost craft brewery. Five stars, Wood Expedition 2 again. <laughs> we store our collection at the Arctic World Archive, which is located in a decommissioned coal mine hundreds of meters beneath the permafrost at a constant temperature between 19 and 23 degrees Fahrenheit. It takes about 20 minutes walking underground to be able to get to the mine, so you most definitely want to have a spare flashlight with you just in case. 
The doors to the vault are opened only two or three times each year, and additions to our collections will be deposited accordingly. Many museums and universities also archive their histories and collections here. The facility is offline, off-grid, carbon neutral, and does not require electricity to maintain the cold, which are additional protections to ensure long-term storage. This is me in my happy place, <laughs> exploring places that are cold and dark and beautiful in their own way. Digital files get converted into visual images at the Arctic World Archives facility near Oslo, Norway, and then transferred onto 35 millimeter film, which is immune to electromagnetic radiation and cyber attacks. The film is not technology dependent, so it could be read with a simple magnifying glass if necessary. It's cold work, but somebody's gotta do it. And we are more than happy to zip up our parkas to make that happen. Now, some people might be wondering, will the Eternal Access Collection ever actually be needed because all other copies of a book might cease to exist? Maybe, maybe not. But that's the whole point of having a backup, right? The Library of Alexandria, the pre-Columbian Mayan codices, the countless libraries lost to the bonfire of the vanities during the Renaissance in 1497, Germany's Institute for Sexual Research in the 1930s, and even the Iraq National Library and Archive in 2003 were decimated. If they had backups, imagine how much more interesting our world would be today. In their own ironic way, book banners often raise visibility and awareness of the very books that they are seeking to silence. Many of the books in our world that are considered great books might not actually have been recognized by the broader public if they were not threatened with censorship at some point in time. Because book banners are trying to silence and erase words and books from our memory, I instead want to amplify those voices for generations to come. Phase one of our project has involved collecting hundreds of historically banned books ranging from Homer's Odyssey to Copernicus's proof that the Earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around, Don Quixote, Charles Darwin, Shakespeare, Madame Bovary, Les Miserables, Edith Wharton, and even Sherlock Holmes. Now, in phase two, we are reaching out to contemporary authors and publishers to include their threatened works in our collections. We started in the United States and are including other countries and are also going to include threatened art and music. We want to expand from Shakespeare to shake it off. <laughs> if you are a believer in free speech, I invite you to be willing to stand up to protect all speech even that of people whom you may fundamentally disagree with. It's not about freedom of my speech, and it's not even about freedom of your speech. It's about freedom of everybody's speech. Let me put it to you this way. As I age, I'm beginning to realize that gravity and the effect that it has on my body is really starting to tick me off. But just because it makes me uncomfortable does not mean that I will deny gravity's existence just to make me feel better about myself. But that's essentially what book banners are trying to do to thoughts and ideas that they disagree with. Book banning can be accomplished through four primary methods. Redaction, relocation, restriction, and removal. And for example, lines of text can be redacted a book can be removed, such as moving a book from the young adult section to the adult shelves. A book can be restricted, whereby you have to ask for special permission just to be able to read that book. And the worst form of banning is removal, which in practical terms can be removal from search engines, being taken off of library shelves, or even being thrown into big, stupid bonfires. The American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedoms 
identified 4,240 individual book titles that were threatened with censorship in 2023. We're talking one year ago, not one century ago. And the number of books being challenged and threatened this year has increased dramatically. These challenges are often being led by an individual or groups that are calling for the banning of dozens or hundreds of books at a time, including many of the books that you see here. Now, I'm not a betting person, but when somebody's calling to ban a dozen or hundreds of books at a time, I am willing to bet that they have neither read nor understood all of the books that they are condemning. I do respect that parents have the right to decide what books their own children should or should not read. And wannabe book banners can instruct their schools and libraries not to allow their own children to have access to whatever books that they're having issue with. But those parents should not be making decisions for other readers. That's the equivalent of saying, I'm on a diet, so none of you can have a cookie. <laughs> Philosophers, visionaries, mad men and mad women, poets, thinkers, anarchists, and scientists are all having their voices threatened because those voices might force some people to have to think outside of their comfortable bubble. About half of the books being threatened today are related to LGBTQ plus and BIPOC voices. Race and racism are another very large category. Now, this does real harm to the most vulnerable individuals by making communities cut off from their own stories. Some people might be wondering, what's the harm of making it harder for someone to read a story about themselves? Does it really make a difference? The answer is, yes, it really does make a difference. Let me ask you this. When you were growing up, was there ever a time when you felt invisible? Or that you were an outcast when everyone else was popular? I know that I did as a boy. And one book that really spoke to me was about a seagull, Jonathan Livingston Seagull by Richard Bach, about a little bird who was an outcast from his flock. But he eventually taught himself to fly higher and faster than any other bird had ever flown. And somehow it resonated to young me. I still recommend that book to some of my friends when they're feeling down. When young people cannot see themselves reflected in the stories that they read, or when the images that they see are negative, distorted, or even mocked, that sends a powerful message to people about how they are devalued in society. And that's also particularly detrimental to younger people who are still developing their own personal identities, values, and worldviews. I can only imagine what would have happened if Jonathan Livingston Siegel had been banned and I, as a young boy, was not able to read it when I needed it most. I do know for sure that I would not be the vivacious, infinitely curious, ruggedly handsome dreamer standing in front of you today. <laughs> I would love everyone here to recognize that we each have the power in our own way to stand up to protect free speech, books, and ideas from the forces of oppression, ignorance, and cruelty. If you want to take your own personal stand, thank you. <laughs> if you want to take your own personal stand against book banning, I do have some suggestions. Read a banned book. Talk to other people about how you feel about book banning. Support your local school boards. Vote. If you don't already have one for your town, go out and get a public library card and thank teachers and librarians for their service. So I ask you now, will you take a stand when our children, our communities, and our world need you most? Thank you very much.